China's People's Liberation Army Navy, or the PLA, in studies past wars to understand how other countries approached warfare. Chinese strategists have carefully studied the Falklands War, the Vietnam War, the First Gulf War, and no doubt the current conflict in Ukraine. They have even looked back to the distant past to study, for example, the First Sino-Japanese War and the First World War, especially at sea. The PLA has drawn profound lessons from these histories to improve its ability to fight and win future conflicts. Chinese writings about these lessons have also shed light on PLA's priorities and preferences. The PLAN has even backtracked more than eight decades to the Pacific War of 1941 to 45. Chinese military thinkers have examined the origins and the progression of the mortal struggle between Imperial Japan and the United States. They have carefully scrutinized each of the great battles at sea, from Pearl Harbor to the Indian Ocean raid, and to Midway and beyond. The Chinese have drawn numerous lessons about what these engagements mean for the future of naval warfare, and to understand these lessons offer valuable insights about the PLA's thinking and strategy. On December the seventh, nineteen forty-one, the Imperial Japanese Navy attacked Pearl Harbor without a declaration of war. From that point on, the Japanese Navy entered its final but most active phase of its history, spanning across approximately four years until August the fifteenth, nineteen forty-five, when Imperial Japan finally surrendered. At the beginning of the war, the Japanese combined fleet was the world's third largest navy and owned the world's largest battleships. But it was totally defeated and destroyed, owing to choosing the wrong military strategy and political strategy. Before we start, it must be noted that Chinese thinkers are very conceptual. Discussions of theory, whether it be international relations or military matters, are very popular with the Chinese elite. In the past, Chinese planners assumed that China. If it has to fight the United States, it would have to fight from a severely disadvantaged position. This line of thinking was dominant in the unipolar moment, during which American military might frequently appeared so overwhelming as to be unstoppable. However, as the PLAN continues its rapid modernization, it increasingly expects to compete and fight with the U.S. Navy on an equal footing. As such, the lessons from the Pacific War increasingly resonated with the PLA, because the war involved two major naval powers who were comparable in technology, at least in the beginning. The first lesson is that the underlying economic and industrial power of the belligerent is the most important factor in determining the outcome of the war. Chinese analysts acknowledged the importance of industrial strength, especially the shipbuilding industry, in carrying out a protracted war at sea. To them, the mismatch between Imperial Japan's economy and its ambitions led to severe overextension that led to its defeat. The destruction of major warships and ground forces accelerated the exhaustion of Japan's very limited resources. At the same time, Japan remained engaged on the Asian continent in mainland China, placing further demand on its already scarce resources. Chinese observers have analyzed the interaction between the industrial capacity and attrition of forces on the oceanic battlefield. They find that Japan's lack of industrial capacity and trained personnel to recover from combat losses was a critical factor in the outcome of the war. Japan lacked both the industry and the raw material to build warships. At a fast enough pace to replace losses suffered in combat.
Similarly, the loss of irreplaceable fighter pilots at Midway and the Coral Sea was a major contributing factor to Japan's declining fortunes. Imperial Japan's inability to rapidly reconstitute its forces had a particularly bad impact on Japanese warfighting. To Chinese analysts, Japan's struggle with material and manpower shortages illustrates the importance of harnessing all elements of national strength in fighting protracted wars. To be clear, Chinese observers generally see China as playing the role of the historical United States in a hypothetical future war in the Pacific. China does not see itself in the position of Japan, at least economically. Indeed, China's position in the 2020s is, in many respects, similar to the United States in 1941. China has a commanding position in manufacturing and industrial power, especially when it comes to shipbuilding. China has enough industrial capacity to replace losses suffered in combat, and it is capable of importing raw material from Russia if it needs to. There are concerns about the US Navy's capacity to replace losses in a prolonged war at sea. US naval shipyards simply do not churn out warships as quickly as Chinese shipyards. Knowing this, the PLA's preferred strategy is to try to inflict more losses on the US Navy than what is sustainable for the US Navy. For example, through the employment of long-range anti-ship missiles, submarine attacks, and small-scale skirmishes with surface warships. The PLA may incur losses among its own forces in the process of doing so, but that would be acceptable to the Chinese Navy because these will be sustainable for China. The PLA's ability to drive up attrition and to sustain losses means the United States will find it difficult to keep up in the long term. The U.S. industrial base and shipbuilding industry have declined over the years, owing to decades of neglect and mismanagement. This means there's a very real resource limitation faced by U.S. forces. In a naval war against China, the United States may find itself outmatched industrially and materially, just like Imperial Japan in the Pacific War. Moreover, the theater of the Pacific War loosely resembles a hypothetical Sino-American conflict. Just as Japan sought to hold off its opponents in distant waters by creating a so-called perimeter of defense, the PLA would be attempting to keep its adversary at arm's length from the Chinese mainland. In the Pacific War, both the US and Japan employed land-based air power to conduct airstrikes against enemy warships. For example, the British battlecruiser the Repulse and the battleship the Prince of Wales were sunk by Japanese aircraft off the east coast of Malaysia. Now China possesses an arsenal of land-based anti-ship ballistic missiles and aircraft to target enemy warships. China also has modern fighting ships with increasing reach. Chinese analysts paid special attention to the role of land-based air power at Midway. They noted that, on the US side, less capable and older aircraft on the Midway Island performed critical duties that led to the American success. Long-range reconnaissance by flying boats and bombers provided an early warning screen and detected the incoming enemy fleet, buying precious time for the smaller defending force to respond. Although the aircraft launched from Midway were tactically ineffective against the Japanese carriers, they distracted the attacking fleet sufficiently to open the chance to deliver a decisive blow by carrier aviation. Another important battle is the one at Guadalcanal. Chinese commentators see the American seizure of Henderson Field 
and the successful defense of the airfield against Japanese counterattacks as crucial to the victory at Guadalcanal. The contest for control of the airfield is the focal point of the island campaign, in which the Japanese army suffered mounting and eventually unsustainable losses. American aircraft launched from the airfield provided close air support to ground operations, defended against Japanese air raids, attacked opposing convoys, and contributed to the sinking of major Japanese warships. In contrast, owing to the distance separating the airbase as Rebel from the action, Japanese aircraft were unable to operate long enough and in sufficient numbers to influence the course of the battle. In the Battle of Okinawa in 1945, the control of land-based airfields was again essential. The invading American fleet was subjected to heavy and unrelenting attacks by land-based Japanese aircraft, including the kamikazes. In the beginning of the campaign, US forces were unable to knock out the many airfields on Kyushu, exposing the US fleet to persistent air raids. Conversely, the American capture of two airfields on Okinawa enabled US air power to provide close air support, fight off enemy air raids, and conduct strikes against air bases on Kyushu. The importance of land-based air power remains very relevant today. In a major naval war against the United States, the PLA would employ firepower in the form of precision strike missiles launched from the mainland to cripple or sink the all-important capital ships of the US Navy, the aircraft carriers. The long-range fighters and bombers, such as the H-6J and the J-16, also has the range to engage U.S. fleets far away from the Chinese mainland. Chinese missiles can also be used against U.S. air bases in Asia, putting them out of action for long periods and destroying aircraft on the ground. China's deployment of the DF-26 intermediate-range ballistic missile means that even U.S. bastions like Guam may not be entirely safe for U.S. warplanes to operate from. If American air power were pushed further and further away from the Chinese mainland, U.S. warplanes may have to operate from places that are too far away to really influence the outcome. Chinese authors have expressed profound admiration for American mastery of logistics during the Pacific War. At the Battle of Guadalcanal, for example, U.S. supply convoys, forward bases, and reasonably good defense of the sea lanes allowed for the constant flow of reinforcements, equipment, and supply to the island. The American handling of its supply was by no means perfect. For example, they did suffer heavy losses in ships to the superior night fighting capabilities of the Japanese Navy. But by and large, American logistics in the Battle of Guadalcanal was successful. In contrast, the Japanese performed poorly in terms of logistics throughout the Pacific War. The Japanese were ill-equipped to resupply their forces on Guadalcanal and in other theaters of combat. American attacks on Japanese supply convoys worsened Japan's logistical challenges. Dwindling supplies and reinforcements sapped the Japanese fighting strength, leaving Imperial Army soldiers without food and ammunition in the Guadalcanal campaign. The same deficiency can be seen in other major battles, for example in the campaigns of New Guinea, Burma, and in 1944-45, the Philippines. Chinese analysts criticized the failure of the Imperial Japanese Navy to attack vulnerable American supply lines throughout the war and failing to concentrate their aerial attacks against exposed American supply dumps. Famously, the Japanese submarine doctrine focused on targeting enemy warships rather than their supply convoys, 
in contrast to the U-boats of the ally Nazi Germany, which employed submarine warfare against convoys headed to Britain to deadly effect. Japanese shipbuilding efforts before the war was focused heavily on building warships and neglected to a large extent on building transports and supply ships to keep its combat forces reinforced and supplied. In short, Japan only ever prepared for battle, but not for war. Chinese naval analyst Liu Yi argued that the American abundance in logistics and transport vessels determined the war's trajectory after the attritional campaign over Guadalcanal. The war was not to be decided exclusively by the gains and losses of warships or islands. Rather, the Pacific War was about the ability to continue developing a nation's industrial potential and to convert that potential into sustained front-line combat power in a long-term struggle. The PLAN certainly understands that logistical capacity, the kind the United States demonstrated in the Pacific War, is essential to Chinese global ambitions. The PLA will need to establish forward bases, field plenty of transports and supply ships, and set up various support facilities at home and abroad. It must be able to demonstrate to other great navies that the PLAN is fully capable of interdicting enemy supply lines while protecting its own supply lines. The PLA understands that logistical weaknesses like Imperial Japan's can be fatal. It recognizes that modern wars consume huge quantities of material, placing enormous strains on logistics. The PLA's doctrine thus calls for attacks against the enemy's lines of communications to undermine the flow of essential supplies needed to keep their front-line combat units fighting. Chinese analysis of the Pacific War revealed important lessons for China's naval strategy. The first lesson is that economic and industrial power of the belligerents is the most important factor deciding the outcome of a naval war. This includes the ability to manufacture ships to replace losses suffered in combat and the access to raw materials. The second lesson is that naval warfare in the modern era will be decisively influenced by land-based air power, whether that be in the form of combat aircraft or anti-ship missiles. The third lesson is the importance of logistics and reinforcements, which are necessary to sustain the fighting strength of the front-line units. Finally, it must be noted that China views its own position as closer to the historical United States as opposed to Imperial Japan. Therefore, it totally makes sense for China to understand what makes the American war efforts in the Pacific War successful.